Amen. Well, would you please give a warm welcome to Pastor Michael Liebler. We are so excited for what God is doing out in Farmingville at local church, and we count it a privilege to have him here with us today. So take it away, my friend. Well, hey, everyone. Man, it is such an honor to be with you this morning uh, here at Beacon Church. It's especially, I'm especially grateful to be here because once upon a time, Beacon Church was a brand new church on Long Island. Now, you've grown up a little bit. And what's great about that is you're like a big brother church now to some of the brand new churches that are starting on Long Island. But you're a big brother in the good sense, right? You're not the big brother that kicks you out of the room. You're like the role model big brother for us to look up to. And so I'm so excited to be here because I hope that one day when local church grows up, because our church is just 23 weeks old today, I hope that when we grow up, we'll be like Beacon Church. I hope that one day, local church will make an impact in our community the way that you've made an impact in yours. I hope that one day, we will be as generous towards our community and generous towards each other as you are here. I hope that one day, local church's discipleship efforts or our efforts to help people take their next best step towards following Jesus, I hope that it will be a strong as Beacon Churches. And I hope that one day I can be as faithful and kind and loving and gracious and good-looking as a pastor as your pastors are here. I hope that one day. So truly, it it is an honor to be be with you all this morning. Uh, To get us started today, let me ask you a question, and don't answer out loud. But uh, I wonder, I wonder if there's anything that you worry about Chances are, the answer is yes. Uh, In fact, you might even be worried right now as you're sitting here. You might have heard some news this week or yesterday or this morning, and it's got you a little anxious. Uh, I think anxiety and and worry is something that maybe all of us can relate to. I know I worry all the time. I worry about money. Uh, I worry about my job and whether or not I'm doing a good enough job at my job. Uh, I worry about my health the health of my family and friends. I worry about our community, our nation. Heck, there's a lot to worry about in the world right now. I worry about local church. I love my dog way too much, and sometimes I worry that he doesn't love me back or that he wished he was adopted by a different family or something. So I got got things I worry about all the time. And again, chances are you do too. And if you've ever wondered, why? why? Why do I worry What is that in me? Where does that come from? You might be interested to know that there is a portion of your brain that is literally wired to make you worry. It's called your amygdala. It is an almond-shaped portion of your brain that's wired for your survival. When your amygdala is activated and triggered, it causes you to do one of three things. It can cause you to fight, to flee, or to freeze. And this is a really good thing because when you find yourself in a dangerous situation, your amygdala gets activated and it sends a message to your brain to send you some adrenaline so that you can do whatever you have to do, fight, flee, or freeze in order to get out of dangerous situations. So if you were to see a poisonous snake, or in my case, any snake, your amygdala would activate and say, run! Or if, if you're driving on the LIE, and there's somebody in the lane next to you that's kind of texting and driving and swerving into your lane, your amygdala activates so that you can be on high alert and do some evasive driving and get out of harm's way. If your house alarm goes off in the middle of the night, your amygdala will activate so that you can wake up your wife and say, go see what's wrong while I hide under the covers. (laughs) Your amygdala is wired for your survival. The, The problem with our amygdala, though, is that it can't always discern the difference between a real threat and something that might not really be a threat. It's not quite objective, and it can be very easily triggered. Uh, For example, 
This time last year, uh, my wife Emily and I, we were living in Kansas City, uh, and we were there because we were a part of a church planting residency. So we were learning how, uh, getting equipped so that we could plant a healthy church one day, and we, we loved our time there. But while we were living there, uh, we were living in an apartment complex, and one night I decided to take our dog Amigo out for a walk. This is Amigo. He's a golden doodle. He is our child our only child, uh, and we love him way too much, as I said before. But I took him out for a walk one night, and we finished up the walk at at this field that was right behind our apartment complex, and it was his favorite place to do his bathroom business, you know? So he takes care of business, and I got a little bag, and I go over there to, like, pick up what he dropped off, and I see something out of the corner of my eye barreling towards us, and I looked, and as I focused, I realized, oh, that's a dog coming our way. That, that's a German shepherd coming our way. Hang on a second. That is a German shepherd who got out of his collar, and his owner is frantically running after him, yelling and waving his arms. And in that moment, both me and Amigo knew this dog isn't coming over here to play. And our amygdalas both got activated. And yes, I looked it up. Dogs have amygdalas too. And so because I was in the middle of picking something up, I'm about five or six feet away from Amigo by the time the German shepherd got to him and wrapped his jaws around Amigo's neck. And Amigo lets out a yelp. It's a sound I never want to hear again in my life. But as he yelps, my amygdala also yelps in my brain. And it says, it's time to fight. See, Amigo doesn't have a mean bone in his body. So when his amygdala activated, it said, it's time to freeze. So he literally sat down and started panting and just let this German shepherd attack him. But mine said, it's time to fight. And I'm not really a violent person. I've never really been into contact sport. But in that moment, I was like, you know, one of those moms that developed the strength to lift a bus or whatever. All of a sudden, I developed these moves that I never knew I had. And just in a second, I was over. I was over there. My, my arm, like, wrapped around the German shepherd's neck, and I kind of pinned it to the ground and leaned on it with my body until his owner finally got there. And by the time it was all said and done, uh, Amigo was okay. He, he just, his neck was sore for a little while, but he was fine. But what I realized after everything was finished up uh, was that I was still holding the bag in my hand. And uh, I never had a chance to tie the bag. So uh, as I'm looking at it, I'm realizing the contents of the bag are no longer in the bag. I don't know where they went. And there was snow all over the ground, so I'm like looking, I'm like, man, where, where could this have gone? And I could not find it anywhere. And so I like to think that the contents of that bag ended up all over that German shepherd. And I'm not that mad about it, to be honest with you. So the moral of the story is do not mess with my child, okay? I, I will turn into the Hulk on you. Anyway, I tell you this story because that was a year ago. And this past year, any time that I see a German shepherd... Something in me gets triggered, and all of a sudden, I can get a little tense, right? My heart starts racing a little faster. It's because my amygdala, it can't discern the difference between a mean German shepherd and a nice one. It just knows, based on my past experience, you might be in danger right now because of what you've experienced. And it's why, it's why some of us, we experience that as well, because our amygdala, our amygdala is maybe triggering, and we don't even know why? It just, it's, it's just giving us signals that, hey, something happened in your past and you might be in danger now, which is why our amygdala needs help from another part of our brain. It needs help from our prefrontal cortex. The, the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that's wired to be logical. So when your house alarm goes off in the middle of the night, your amygdala gets triggered and it says, oh my gosh, you're going to die. But your prefrontal cortex, it steps in. It's like, hang on a second. There's probably a logical explanation for this. You're most likely not going to die. It's probably just the cat. And together, your amygdala and your prefrontal cortex, they actually make a pretty good team. And they balance each other out. Where you begin to see some problems is when the amygdala starts to dominate the conversation, leaving no room or little room for your prefrontal cortex to step in. And when this happens, again, you might find yourself worried and you don't even know why you're worried. You might find yourself triggered and you're not even sure why you're triggered. Because perhaps in your past, you've experienced some sort of trauma or hurt or pain. And now, every time you're around 
a certain type of person or a certain person. Every time you're in a particular place or you smell a certain smell or you hear some news, all of a sudden, you're riddled with anxiety. You've got shortness of breath, and, and, and again, perhaps you don't even know why. Now, if there's anybody, if there's anybody who's walked this planet who might be familiar with the idea of an amygdala hijack, of their amygdala being a little overactive, I think, I think it could be the Apostle Paul. You see, if, if you don't know about the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul steps onto the pages of history as someone who hated Christians. If you hate Christians, he hated them more. Literally, he made it his full-time job to stomp out Christianity in the first century. It was his job to hunt down Christians, violently persecute them, and then throw them in jail and sometimes approve of their death. That's how much he hated Christians. But then, it's crazy, he became one. And he became like one of the most famous ones. And he went all throughout, after he became a Christian, he went all throughout the known world, planting all, all sorts of churches all over the place. And then he kept up with those churches by sending them mail, letters in the mail. And he didn't know it then. But over time, the church collected those letters and they compiled them together with some other documents to form what we call our New Testament, which is like the second half of our Bible. So without even knowing it, the Apostle Paul is like responsible for writing over 50% of the New Testament. But in order for him to write those letters and in order for him to plant all those churches, it cost him something. And I'm not talking financially. Because every letter that he wrote and every church that he planted, he had to endure some of the most challenging, difficult situations where he experienced suffering and pain and imprisonment. And I just imagine after all he experienced, there's nowhere that he could go. There's no people that he could be around where he wasn't in danger of an amygdala hijack, where he wasn't in danger of having his amygdala tell him, uh-oh, you better be careful because you might be in danger, even if there is no danger. And the reason why I think that is because in one of the letters that he wrote, to the church in Corinth, he described what it was like to be him. Listen to what he says it was like to be him. He, he says this. He says, I have worked harder. I've been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again, to which I read. I'm like, man, Paul, wow, that is a lot. He's like, this ain't nothing yet. I got a lot more. He continues. He says, five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. And for those of us who have a hard time with math like me, that's 195 times he's been whipped. But not only whipped, three times he was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, he said. This one gets me every time. Do you know what happens when you get stoned? You die. You die, which means he was so close to death after the stoning that they literally thought he was dead. It's like, yeah, but I'm not done yet. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent the whole night and day adrift at sea. Could you imagine floating in the ocean, no food, no water for 24 hours, just waiting for the shark to come and eat you? Could you imagine that? I would just be miserable. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. In other words, there's nowhere I can go. In the city, in the desert, on the sea, wherever I am, I've experienced danger. He continues, and I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, I know what it's like to be betrayed by somebody that I thought I could trust. Some of you know exactly what that's like. He continues, I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty, and I've often gone without food, which might sound like the most painful thing on the list to some of you, going without food. Wow. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. And he continues, then, besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. 
talk about a prime candidate for worry. In summary, I think, I think what Paul could say is, my amygdala, yeah, it's, it's constantly in overdrive. It's constantly activated. I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. I can't be around any people where it's not telling me, whoo, you might be in danger. Danger's probably lurking around the corner. So if anybody knew what it was like, or at least if anybody knew what the potential would be to be riddled with anxiety always, I think it would be the Apostle Paul. And the reason why I I wanted you to, to read that, the reason why I want you to know the history of the Apostle Paul is because I think his history and what he's had to endure will give more credibility to what we're about to read. Because four years after he wrote this, four years after he described what it's like to be him, he wrote another letter, a letter to the church in Philippi where he gave them some advice at the end of his letter. I want to read to you the advice that he gave that church, but I want you to read it or hear it in light of what we just read, in light of all that he's been through. And just keep in mind that this is four years after this, which means four more years of trial, four more years of suffering, four more years of experiencing danger, and also being imprisoned once again. In fact, he's penning the words we're about to read in prison. Listen to the advice that he gives to the church in Philippi. He says this. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. You don't have to let your amygdala hijack your mind. Sure, let it alert you. That's what it's there for. But then you can stop it at that point and you don't have to let it continue. Don't worry about anything. And I got to admit, when I was first reading this, before I knew much, I remember reading this and thinking, come on, Paul. I didn't even know it was Paul who wrote it when I was like, come on, Bible. You don't know me. You don't know what it's like to be me. You know what it's like to grow up in America when all your friends are getting the latest and coolest phones and you're stuck with a flip phone. Tell me not to worry about anything. You don't, you don't know me. <laughs> but when I discovered who Paul was, and what he had gone through, and all that he had endured, and when I discovered that he was literally writing these words in a prison, I became a little more interested in what he had to say next, and I hope you will be too. Because he goes on, he says, look, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray. Pray about everything. Now, if you're looking for a bottom line or, or a point, this is the only point for today's message. This is it. This is the single bottle. I can't say it better than this. It's don't don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. And and, and if you're tempted to kind of roll your eyes at that, like, oh, come on. You know, like you you might not be against prayer, but it's like, you know, like prayer's not paying the bills though. You know, if that's that's how you're feeling, I get that. I totally get that. But but let me just say this. Before you check out, just, just hear me out on this. Prayer is probably more powerful than you think. And I'm not talking just about the spiritual implications or the mysterious side of prayer. Set all that aside for a second. I'm just talking about the mental health benefits, the physical health benefits of prayer. It's probably more helpful and more powerful than you think. Dr. Caroline Leaf, who wrote the book Switch on Your Brain, she says this in her book. She says, it has been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. Prayer is so powerful that it can literally change the chemical makeup of your brain. Here's why. Because your brain, your brain has billions and billions of neural pathways traveling all throughout it. You can think of it as kind of like mental walking trails in your mind, every time you think a thought, a new neural pathway is being formed in your brain. And the more you think that thought, the easier it is for you to think it again, because the stronger that pathway becomes. This is really good news when what we're thinking is good and true. It's not so good news when what we're thinking is untrue or toxic. So just like toxicity and negative thoughts can pollute our mind, 
focused prayer can heal our minds. It's fascinating, which, which might be why Paul was able to endure all that he endured. Because he knew that, look, look rather than worrying about this, I, I can do something much more powerful than worry. I can pray. He, he continues. He says, tell God. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. So if you've ever wondered, how do you pray? Do I have to memorize something and repeat it over and over again? Do I have to be in a certain place, in a certain posture? How do you pray? I think Paul would say, no, 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 that. You just got to talk to God. You just got to talk to God to tell him what you need. Thank him for all he's done. So when your amygdala tries to take over and keep you up all night long worrying about something, great. Now you know what to talk to your heavenly father about. Tell him what you need. Thank him for what he's done. And you know what will happen then? Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. This is Paul. This is Paul making a promise. This is Paul saying, Lula, don't, don't ask me to explain, but here's the thing. When you pray, I'm just telling you, you are going to experience a type of peace that's really hard to understand, but it's going to be there. And this is a man who knew what it was like to face tri trial to experience loss, to experience suffering and pain. And yet he would still say, look, I am just telling you, when you pray, you will experience a peace that exceeds all of our understanding. And this actually makes sense because if you've ever been to therapy, you know that a good therapist, they will have you verbalize your fear. They will have you verbalize your anxieties and your worries because just the act of speaking what scares you or speaking what's on your mind or speaking what you're worried about, just the act of speaking it out loud tends to lower your anxiety. So 2,000 years ago, Paul was saying, yeah, do that. You can verbalize whatever's on your heart and do it to, and direct it towards your heavenly father because when you do, it's not gonna make it go away. Heck, Paul was still in a prison cell. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't his plan. It doesn't mean everything's going to go according to plan. What it does mean is your peace levels will increase as you pray. He says this, his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I think Paul would say, if you want to win the battle against worry in your life, against anxiety in your mind, the first step is to recognize that that's a really hard battle to fight on your own. It's a really difficult battle to win by yourself. But the good news is, if the Apostle Paul is right, your heavenly father is standing by, waiting to step in and guard your mind and guard your heart. And all you have to do is talk to him and let him lead you. That, that's what it means to, to live in Christ Jesus. It's to be led by him, because here's the truth about all of us. We're all living in something. If you can be like I can be, where on, on my bad days, I, I can tend to think some pretty negative thoughts about myself. I can tend to think things like, oh man, you know, I'm never gonna be good enough. I'm never gonna add up. I'm just unworthy. I'm worthless. If you can tend to have thoughts like that, do you know what you're living in? You know what I'm living in when I have those thoughts? Shame. I'm living in shame. We're all living in something. Some of us are living in anger, in greed, in guilt, in jealousy, in panic. And Paul would say, look, you're going to live in something. You should live in Jesus or you should follow Jesus because we're all following something. And if you do, I'm just telling you, his peace will begin to guard your hearts and minds as you do that. Live in Christ Jesus. And then it gets really, really practical because Paul knows that our lives tend to move in the direction of our strongest thoughts. And he, tells, he says this as a final piece of advice to the Philippians. He says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts because your life moves in the direction of your strongest thoughts. So fix them on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. All thoughts that tend to be a result of living in Jesus. Because when we're living in something else, 
and when we're especially living in worry, our thoughts tend to be less than pure, less than true, less than admirable, less than lovely. It's Paul say, come on, come on. F- follow Jesus, or you should at least consider following Jesus because when you do, you will experience a peace that will guard your hearts and mind and exceed your understanding. Now, if you're like me, you might hear advice like this, and again, you might think, all right, you know, I'm not against prayer. Like the prayers in the room, by the way, you're like, yeah, best message ever, I love prayer, right? But for like 99% of the rest of us, right, you're kind of like, all right, I'm not against prayer, but it seems maybe a little impractical, maybe a little irresponsible, right? Because what am I supposed to do? Lock myself in a closet and just pray all day? Right? Again, that's not, gonna, that's not gonna pay the bills. So let me just say this. I don't think Paul is advocating that you pray only and you do nothing else. And the reason why I don't think that is because when you wanna know what somebody means when they say something, you look at what else they say and you watch what they do. And if you were to watch the Apostle Paul, you know what you would discover? You would discover that he is a doer. The reason why we know about the Apostle Paul is because of all the things that he did. In just a few decades, the Apostle Paul did more than all of us will do in our lifetimes put together. And he did it all without an iPhone or ibuprofen. All right, it's amazing. (laughs) Paul was a doer. So I think he would say something like this, like, in it, you, you should pray. That should be your first step. If you've got anxiety, if you've got worry, if your amygdala is triggered, you should take that to your heavenly father and talk to God about that. But in addition to doing that, you should, we should all do what we can do. Meaning if you've got a test that's kind of like got you anxious, you should talk to your heavenly father about that. He cares about that. But you should also study for that test. If you're worried about your health, right, you should talk to your heavenly father about that. But you should start eating right and exercising, and getting good advice. I think Paul would say, in addition to prayer, do what we can do, and give God what we can't do, because there's a lot, there's a lot in this life that is out of my control. In fact, most of life is out of my control. But the one thing that we all have control over, we all have control over what we can choose to surrender, and you can always give God what's out of your control. I think Paul would say, do what you can do, Give God what you can't do, and then trust God no matter what. Trust him no matter what. And the reason why Paul lived this way, and I think the reason why Paul would say this is because he knew that when somebody dies for you, they are for you, and you can trust them. And Paul just had this sense that, man, there is nothing that I could ever do that would make God love me more, and there's nothing I could ever do that would make him love me less There is nothing that could separate me from his great love. I can trust him even when I'm in a prison cell, even when I'm being beaten, even when I'm being shipwrecked. I can trust God no matter what. And when I do, his peace will exceed anything I could ever understand. Now, uh, when Emily and I knew that it was time to start local church, we were really excited about that. But we were also uh, extremely nervous because there was a lot to worry about. And one of the things that uh, I, in particular, worried about the most was how we were going to fund it. Because it's expensive to start a church, but it's really expensive to start a church on Long Island, as you might imagine. And we don't have like some headquarters somewhere that's bankrolling the whole thing. The burden of raising the funds to do this was on us. And so pretty much on a daily basis, uh, I was susceptible to thoughts that would creep in and try to pollute my mind by saying, you are going to epically fail. Even Amigo is going to grow a hand so that he can point at you and laugh at how, what a failure you are. Those thoughts would just creep into my mind constantly getting me all worried, wondering maybe we should just not do this, maybe we should quit or whatever. (laughs) But but Emily and I, we created a couple of other things like declarations that we would constantly say out loud to one another and that we would turn into prayers as well in an effort to combat those neural pathways that were telling us that we were just gonna epically fail. So based on what we believed was true about God and thoughts that we believed were honorable and admirable, and lovely, and right, 
we started telling ourselves these other things. We, we started saying this all the time. We said, look, here's what we're going to do. Even though this is going to be challenging, we are going to work as hard as we possibly can and do whatever we can, but we're going to trust God with the rest because that's all we can do. So God, would you help us? Give us the energy and the strength to do whatever we can do in this situation, but help us to trust you with everything else. And, and then we would say this all the time. We would say, look, it's only our job to ask. That's it. We have to ask. It's God's job to provide. So I pray, God, give me the wisdom and the, to know who to ask, what to ask for, and give me the courage to ask. But God, help me trust you all along the way. And, and then we would say this. We would say, Man, our dad, talking about God, our dad is, is rich. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That's the way he describes himself. So we're like, God, can you spare a cattle or two over here in our direction? And we say, God, look, you, you're rich. This is nothing for you. And then we'd say this, our God, he always pays for what he orders. So if he's ordering a brand new church on Long Island, he will pay for it. And I'm just telling you, as we begin to pray those things and talk about those things and combat our anxious thoughts with those declarations, it gave us the courage to get started. It gave us the motivation to keep going when things weren't going so well. And it humbled us as we begin to watch God provide over and over and over again so that a new church on Long Island could get started. So I got to ask, what about you? Got anything on your mind? Got anything on your heart? Got any worries that are consuming your thoughts? Is there a chance that maybe some of us in this room, we have surrendered and given God our life, our eternity even. We've trusted him with all that, but we've kind of held on to our thoughts, maybe held on to some of those things that worry us. I think Paul would say, look, you don't have to hold on to that worry. You don't have to worry at all. You, you can tell God what you need. You can pray to your heavenly father. And when you do, you will experience a peace that exceeds all understanding. After all, if you're living in something else, if you're living in pain or shame or worry or anxiety or fear, none of those things, you don't need the preacher to tell you this, you know this, none of those things are gonna lead you to peace. You know that. Paul would say, no, no, Jesus will lead you to peace. In fact, in the words of Jesus, and I'll leave you with this, he said this, you can come to me all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, and you will find rest for your souls. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you for preserving these letters. Thank you for preserving this text so that 2,000 years later, we can learn about you. We can learn about what you're like and how you feel about all of us. God, would you give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we've heard this morning? And would you give us the courage to take whatever our next step is and for those of us who are experiencing a crippling anxiety, a crippling worry, God, you tell us you can provide a peace that exceeds our understanding. And I am praying for you to step in this morning and guard the hearts and the minds that are just overwhelmed with anxiety, with your peace. Thank you that we can trust you no matter what because, because you, after all, were willing to send your own son to die on our behalf. Thank you for being for us and for loving us. God, I pray that you are honored this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. It's an honor to be with you guys this morning. Thanks so much for, for having me. Yeah.